Everyone, welcome to the Gear Priority Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, and I'm here today with Tayson and Brigham from Outdoor Vitals. We're going to be talking about the design process and how products go from kind of a twinkle in someone's eye to being production ready and everything in between. So welcome, Tayson, Brigham. How's it going? Okay. Glad to be here. Good to be here. We're, we're doing this outside. We just got back from a three-day hike where I got to test out a bunch of awesome Outdoor Vitals gear and chat with these guys it's it's apparent that these guys are, are gearheads and uh, are out testing their gear and it's it was neat to to see some of the new products that they've been releasing and talk about how those products were designed and the the details that went into them and that's kind of what i want to talk about today with you guys um and just go over how that process looks for you and and um how a product may make it to market or may, maybe it gets put on the on the chopping room on the floor of the of the design room and never actually makes it there so let's let's start off with how, how do you get to the point of we need to create this product we need to design this product and it's something that we want to bring to market um it's actually more diverse than like just one kind of way that happens um oftentimes we will just kind of see a, like a gap in our product line, you know, knowing that we want to have like a pretty full product line for what the backpacker needs. Um, so that's like the really easy ones. Um, but then there's um, things like if we're talking, say, clothing, we know that there's people who have different preferences, like say merino versus synthetic, you know. Um, but we... I'd say we approach them all by looking at um, our own experience and what we consider, you know, kind of like our target customer, what their experiences are and what the, I guess the maybe deficiencies are just things that can be improved upon or done better. Um, and sometimes there's just something that we feel like just doesn't meet the needs. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I would, like, if you were to ask me that, I'd, I think a, a lot of overlap, I think it would just be, we try to design from a place of empathy a lot, so we try to be our target avatar, which means we try to spend a lot of time outside using the gear, and I'd say our best ideas typically come from being out here using the gear, um, so that's that's probably number one of where just ideas come from, is, man, it'd be really nice to have this, or, hey, this piece of gear worked really well, how could we take that and improve upon it, and then... Um, there's just aspects too of, of within this industry and um, everything that it encompasses. Uh, we have really great partners too that sometimes can bring us um, newer developments and then we can take that and by the time in the, that we spend in the field and just the time Brigham spends just constantly designing, sometimes we can see something and just see a great application right away. And so it can come from all areas, but I would say, you know, design empathy from from being target users is is where we try to keep our focus and where I feel like our best ideas come from. Yeah, um, he, he makes a good point about um, like the suppliers or, and our, our supplier partnerships. And what he's referring to is like, they will develop uh, a new material. Uh, let's say it's a fabric or an insulation um, and they'll explain it to us, they'll introduce it to us. And that's where kind of the spark comes from because we can see, we can relate what they're bringing to the table to all of our field experience, like out backpacking. And then we can almost see an immediate application to use the new material. So that's what he talks about. They'll, they'll let us know about a new something, a new development. It's, it's some kind of material that we can use to make an end product with. And, and it's, it's really energizing a lot of times because it's, uh, we see it as something that, um, we can see the immediate benefits and how that will benefit, you know, our target audience. And that's who we try to be, you know, like we're, the other thing you said is we're empathetic design is what that really means is like, we are like, we backpack. I don't know if anybody knows or cares, but like I backpack a lot. I, I, I could attest to that. Yeah. These guys, these guys are good backpackers. <laughs> and then I'm the one designing the gear. So it's really easy to have that, that conduit of idea from experience to a product is because it's, oftentimes just coming straight from experience to designing it so yeah i think i think we're really fortunate too that sometimes when they bring us ideas we have great partners and we've grown enough to the point where we can say hey could you tweak this because there's an, an awesome application if we got this fabric 
you know, a little bit lighter or it was just nylon instead of a blended with, you know, this or, and, and so, yeah, it's, that's also just a, a piece of the puzzle is, is, you know, they bring us these cool concepts and say, this is what we're capable of. And we're like, sweet. Could you do it this way? Cause we see this really cool trajectory with it. Yeah. There's like, you can pick out the potential. Um, and oftentimes it's like ready to go, but then there's plenty of times where it's taste saying like, we see the potential that it could reach if we made some tweaks to it. How often are you guys going to manufacturers with ideas and then them kind of coming back and saying, we, we don't, we don't have the technology or the capabilities to manufacture that, um, right now. Is that something that happens? And then if that happens, are you then putting kind of that idea on the back burner until someone comes to you with, with something that makes it, allows it to happen? Yeah. It- it has happened. It does not happen often. It's not, not something we experience a lot, but it, it, it has happened. And that's, it's pretty much as you described, it's like, okay, well then we'll sit on that idea indefinitely until the time is right. Yeah. Certain products that can happen, but, and then other, maybe other times too, you'll bring an idea to them. And this happened a lot more when I was the one designing product, but like you bring an idea to them and then they come back and say, that can't work because of this and this. And you're like, oh, I didn't even realize that was a thing, right? So, um, you know, there there is a little bit of back and forth there, but we have, we've, we've got really awesome, capable partners, so it doesn't happen that often. There is, sometimes there's some humor because they will, they'll they'll get really excited about showing us a new fabric or something and, and we'll just, you know, just have to explain to them like, that's cool, um, but that's like, we have no use for that. Like n- nobody, um, we, we're not going to make a tent out of that fabric or whatever it is. You know what I mean? The, yeah. It's, um, they, they know us pretty well and like, but there's, there's still, you know, some things where they get excited about a new material and it's just not applicable. And, th- and that happens with, with everything, even with like backpacking gear, companies make products and it's not, it's not going to be for everyone. And some people are going to be like, yeah, sorry, not, not for me. Yeah. Um, how, how do you guys go about identifying your your target user that avatar that you mentioned earlier that is 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 it for each product are you establishing that avatar or do you kind of have a company-wide avatar that you're designing for so we have um so currently like company-wide um for everything we have two target two target avatars um and to answer your question about like specific products yes we do also do that as well so like one product might not be for both avatars or, you know, so that just means that sometimes there's products that are more specific to one of the avatars, but we do have two avatars that we, that we focus on and, and then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of get more specific from there. So you you always kind of have that North star and you may tweak it a little bit, um, depending on how specific you want to get, I guess, for, for that user. Okay. And then once, once you have that, avatar um identified like what's what's the what's the next kind of step um are you doing like a feasibility analysis uh, to see if this product is even something that is worth making like how did the economics of making gear factor into things um we may do something like that that's not we're not specifically consciously doing a feasibility study that's really focused. Um, but I think we, we really, um, assess an idea, its suitability, you know, like its feasibility, um, you know, cost really isn't, um, you know, cost of the product is, is not really in the discussion. Um, but we certainly do like, you know, we analyze like, is this actually something that, isn't just a good idea for us, but is a good idea for the people that we want to buy it. You know, the people that we think it could help, but, um, we, we definitely look at it that way. It's, it's definitely where a team comes in handy too. Cause, um, you know, every once in a while I might pitch a wild idea to Brigham and Brigham's like, no, or, you know, just some of that. But, um, I think, I think again, that's just where we get so much value with prioritizing time and field. Um, because you can see, like if, if we get excited about it, we're like, oh my gosh, that would significantly increase our experience or something like that. Like it's, it's pretty clear. Like I can't imagine trying to design product for an industry that I wasn't an avid user of. Cause 
I think you'd have major risks of having, you know, some of your products get designed and just not, not work out for that avatar, right? Like you'd have to do, you'd have to invest a ton more into, you know, just interactions with your avatar and surveys with your avatar and, and outside testing and, and just, just go that route in order to not have that happen. Otherwise you could totally get a product to the end of the line and be like, release it to crickets, you know? And so I think that again, it just does play a pivotal part, but how, how close are you guys to the avatar, the two avatars that, that you kind of have? Is it, are you, are you similar? So it makes it easier. Yeah. Uh, we're pretty much it. I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's not much, there's not much difference. I would say like at least 80 to 90%, um, you know, of our, our detailed description of the avatar would, would probably fit. Yeah. Like, I mean, to, and just to like maybe touch on that just a little bit, a lot of our avatar is just, you know, kind of, kind of gearheads, even like yourself, Justin, where it's like you, you're, you really care about performance of product because you might be pushing the limits of that product. You might be like a, a massive three day weekend warrior, or you may be a through hiker, but like, um, or maybe you've been a previous through hiker or, but like, it's, it's people that are really paying attention to gear and maybe pushing limits on gear and, um, you know, and just, uh, you know, kind of like us, like, like we're going to get out on a couple big trips a year and, and but we're also going to do a lot of, uh, three day weekend type stuff. And, and usually in those, like, we're not, we're, we might be going to a destination or something, right? We might be, so that, that may require some different gear choices than if we were kind of um, just logging 10 miles a day through not very steep or rugged terrain or, you know, and so we, we do, yeah, like that, that just plays into it. And, and really like, it's like, if you looked at the three of us, you'd, you'd be looking at our avatar essentially. Yeah. I mean the, like to really sum it up, it's, it's an avid backpacker that because of experience understands like the, the critical significance that gear choices can make to their backpacking experience. So you know, it's, I think there's a lot of people that like to research gear, um, and use it once a year. And like, that's, that's really not our avatar. You know, they tell you everything about every piece of gear out there, but, but they might not be able to tell you like why it matters, but you know, an avid backpacker that understands why things matter or why a piece of gear matters, um, or why it helps them have a better experience. Like that's kind of, kind of it. And, and I think you, you, you touched, touched on something earlier. And I think it kind of plays into that a little bit is, is, is the pricing aspect that you, <laughs> during the, you don't really do a feasibility as, assessment from a pricing standpoint and you're like that. I, and I've definitely, I've, I've listened to, to your podcast a lot and there's some interesting kind of tidbits I'd like to get into a little bit later, but I'm curious as far as competitors go, um, are you, are you guys, when you guys are designing a piece of gear, like let, let's say a backpack, like the CS40, you guys just released that, um, new pack were you guys looking and doing an assessment of what's what's on the market what other competitors are doing what features they're including um and how that might play in or are you just kind of looking at it from a a blank slate or is it kind of like a, a merge what what percentage if it is a merge i'd say it's more of a more of a more of a blank slate with an awareness of like what's out there i don't, I don't think you can be um it's hard to be kind of the person we just described like an avid backpack backpacker that understands why their gear matters and not really be aware of generally what's out there um that's probably how i would describe it yeah i, I would just second that i think it's like we don't want to start with a blank slate and then design the exact same product as someone else like you, we've got to be aware and and whatnot um but we're not we're not necessarily like just like taking a product that's out there and trying to tweak a few things like at all. Right. I, th I think that blank slate is, is much more accurate to what we're doing. Um, and have been doing, you know, really ever since Brigham came on, I, I, you know, and then maybe in the very, very early days, I was a little bit more of that, but I'm not a designer. I was just designing gear. Um, and I've kind of cut my teeth through the process of building this company. Right. But, um, yeah, I, I Brigham, even when I suggest things like that, Brigham's kind of like, no, I want a blank slate. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah yeah and you i look at it even kind of like maybe maybe more of like kind of like from the building it from the ground up because there's always going to be like gear is so synergistic and everything kind of contributes to other things so if you just take something else and try to tweak it you may just end up with like a like a patchwork 
solution as opposed to having something that's just really cohesive. Yeah, that's definitely true. And I feel for me, there's definitely a, an element of kind of feeling this, um, it's a little bit of a duty to the customer to, to have the most like, like kind of an unbiased approach to it. Um, and I feel like it's, it'd almost be selling the customer short to be, you know, to kind of do what Taysen described, like, let's just tweak something to make it like our little take or like make it tweaks so we can say it's ours. Then I wouldn't be able to look a customer in the face and say like, I thought this through 100% from infancy and, and created this with you in mind, you know what I mean? And cause like, that's really, that's, uh, that's the genuine truth about it is like, that's how it is, you know, like we could run across somebody and they could tell me a bunch of negative feedback and, and, and like, we would just have to take that to heart or they could give us a bunch of positive feedback and we could feel really good because, um, cause they're appreciating every bit of thought that we put into a product. And, and that's kind of what I hope for. And, and as you're kind of thinking about, thinking about the product and, and putting that thought into it, how, how do you decide on what to prioritize? Cause there's always compromises with gear. Do you guys list that out right from the start or is it something that kind of comes a little bit later in the design process? We, we try to make, we try to kind of establish priorities very, very early on. Um, cause it, it makes the development process much more streamlined and smooth. And then, um, it's a, it's a little bit of a foundation, um, it, which is helpful because sometimes we can get distracted with ideas and then you're just kind of losing time that you don't have to lose. Um, if you kind of just remember some important priorities and then take it from there. With use it, using the CS40 pack as, as an example, what, what were the priorities with, with that pack as you're going through the design process? Um, comfort, um, stability, load transfer, um, and durability, all of those combined for, you know, a, a lightweight pack. Like, um, it, I can tell you the priority was not to make the lightest pack that we could, um, but it was to make um, a lighter pack than one of the packs that we offer, um, but it had to, like, but it had to be durable. Um, so, and I, I think, I think you'd be uh, thinking about the CS40, I, um, it, you, you guys, I think prioritize a lot, a, a lot of things like you, that you, like you, there's things that you really wanted to get right, which we, it'd be easy to compromise on some of those things, but you saw, like, I got, I managed that I got to test the CS40 for the last, last few days here and I can, it's, it's, it's a great, great pack that doesn't really compromise on a ton of things. Um, and that, that must make it more difficult. Like it'd be easy to say, okay, well, we'll just compromise on weight. It'll, it'll be durable. It'll be comfortable, but, but it's going to weigh over three, three pounds or something like that. I think that's a lot of companies end up in that higher weight range, but trying to design something that's durable and comfortable, um, that's lightweight is, is difficult. Is what, is there a compromise with the CS40? Is there, or are, are there compromises that, um, you had to make that you, if, if you're like, you could just you could just design anything and add a ma magic wand for materials and everything that you could um uh, materials is tough i don't think we could i don't think we could uh spend more on materials on that pack i think i think i think maybe maybe maybe, maybe that's the compromise <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. um so 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 one uh i'll just the easy one is like in terms of functional functional features there's a compromise there 100 percent um there's the only zippers are on the hip belt pockets you know so this is a it's a top loading pack and that's to many that's a compromise and and i think it's totally fine to acknowledge like that's the compromises it's um it's uh low on features and organization and storage you know methods of storage um that's for sure a compromise it's a yeah like it's a top loading pack um without many external pockets 
Yeah. And, and, and some people may, may think that's a negative. And then other people like myself is I appreciate that you have one big pocket, two side pockets, and then you have, and um, your hip belt pockets and a big stretchy pocket. Like that's more, more than enough for, for me and probably a lot of people out there for their organizational needs. Um, I think Taysom, Taysom, you, you mentioned it'd be great if it was, if it was made for half, half the price. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that is a compromise, right? Is we took when we started this pack, we, we set out and said, like, we're making this for very avid, like the very avid user, right? Someone who's doing a long trail, someone who's, you know, very particular about the performance of their gear. And, and so with that, you know, it was, we didn't hold anything back on price. So you look at the frame of that pack, it's 10 times more expensive than our aluminum frame in our other pack. And you look at the fabrics on that and it's, they're ridiculous, right? But, but the end result is, is is really what we wanted. Um, and, and for us, the price lands where it lands. And that's kind of, um, I think I think that is one, you know, obviously that's one benefit of being a direct-to-consumer company is that price could have landed a lot higher using both carbon and ultra fabrics, you know. But um, yeah, it's that that was probably the compromise is that we didn't, we deprioritized price, you know, potentially in some people's eyes to make this really high-performing product. But I wouldn't say that's, that's uncommon or different for this particular product. That's just we design and the price lands where it lands. So, yeah, that's, that's that was kind of the follow up I wanted to have from the previous comment of not really doing like a pricing assessment kind of right off the bat. I, I imagine that's not not the norm in the industry as far as there's there's probably of what kind of margins can we squeeze out of this product before we even go into the design phase and see if it's going to happen. Well, we get to design for one user, right? Um, if you were designing for a big retail company, you have to design for the retail buyer, the stores that are going to be stocking it, and the end user, right? So price point is is a massive, massive factor because this retail store might say, okay, you're, you're XYZ back company and your spot in our store is a $200 backpack. And if you come back and say, hey, we want to design a $300 backpack, they say, well, brand XYZ is in the $300 category. You're in this category. Or so on and so forth, right? So it really does change from the very beginning, which is why why we often, like, I mean, until we get a, a factory completely trained with working for us, when we first start a project, their first question that they'll ask a few times is, what's your target price point? What's your target price point? And for us, we don't have one, right? And it takes a few asks and a few answers and then a few projects before factories finally stop asking us that question, you know? And so it is different that we get to design 100% for the person buying the pack, um, not necessarily any of these middlemen. Yeah, that's a really good point about um, the retail buyers because um, I think it's unfortunate for just the, the the outdoor you know users out there um, that a lot of what ends up in people's hands is to a, a significant degree dictated by retail buyers. Um, because those retail buyers are the company making the products. That's that's their cash cow is large retail accounts, and so they're very biased to do what a retail buyer asks them to do. And it does not mean that the retail buyer is designing the pot the product, but they're heavily influencing it. Like they'll say, like we're not going to buy that, or our our customers aren't going to buy that product because it's too expensive, or we already have purchased made a huge purchase order for this product in that price category so um, that's a significant factor in the products that end up in the user's hands that I think it's it's valuable for people to know about and um, it, that's I enjoy our position of you know being small and like hey here's another compromise of that's a result of us being a smaller company like we compromised on colors like we offer our backpack in one color and that's because we're small and we we make we try to make very wise financial decisions as a as a business um and it is a little too much for us to be comfortable with financially to offer more than one color so there's there's a there's a compromise right there how do how do patents factor just kind of switching gears a little bit here um i i i've nerded out on patents a little bit over the years as far as especially with sleeping pads looking at um sleeping pad manufacturing and all, and all the patents that are kind of dictating where wh- how how different manufacturers can can create their sleeping pads you get you guys create a sleeping pad recently 
Um, and with, with that, as well as other gear, are you guys running into patents? Um, do you, do you guys, I guess, kind of follow up after that? Do you guys, um, patent things at all either? So, um, I'll answer part of it. So for, yeah, we do pay attention to patents, um, and we've had to like dig in and read at length, you know, many different patents to, to make sure we're not conflicting or having any issues there. Um, and you know, it also is, you know, um, a lot of great ideas have already been somebody else's great idea. So that's another, it's like a cross check sometimes is like, yeah, I had this, I thought this was a cool idea, but somebody else a long time ago already did that and paid for a patent. So, um, but you know, with, with your other question about patents, you know, we've, we've done that. Yeah. I mean, I would say the simpler the product is in general, like the more likelihood we may have issues with patents. So sleeping pads is the number one product where patents come into play heavily. Right. Um, but in a lot of our other designs, we haven't had issues with it. Um, we do hold a patent, um, but it's on a, a design from 2016 time frame, kind of. And, um, we were really just dis discontinuing that line. So we, we've dabbled with, with patents, um, something we do pay attention to, and maybe we should be paying attention more to it from a, what can we patent of our stuff, uh, perspective. But, um, thankfully we've really only run into conflicts with design and patents in probably the sleeping bag, the sleeping pad category from what I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, there's not as many other products that that I've ran across that have a lot of patents. Like, like I haven't really seen many patents with or any maybe with packs, tents. There's there's a handful out there. Um, I think I think maybe part of it is due to the the fact that a lot of the innovation of sleeping pads has happened in the last 25 years. So all those patents are still still valid. Maybe maybe expiring soon. But um, if there were any patents with like with some other tents or, or packs, maybe they're they're much older. And prior, prior art is like the biggest thing for patents. So if someone already built it and then you try to patent it, like it can totally undermine your patent. So I would say that, let's say you're talking about tents, you know, it's very possible that, that like the geodome tent, you know, like came out before patents were like hot on people's minds or maybe they have run out, but like in the last 25 years, I'd say patents have become like a way of business. And so it's, it's much more likely that as people have developed some of these things, they're more, they're more mainstream of thinking of, okay, how do I patent this versus maybe some of the prior art that's and prior art just means someone's built it and sold it before you. And, and I think that probably plays into it as well. Okay. That, that, I was just curious about patents cause that's always on my mind and I haven't had uh, much opportunity to ask, to ask, uh, designers and, and brands about that. I mean, when you think about something getting designed and like adding a patent, I think that's the first thing to say is like, why didn't they patent this? Well, if you look and dig, like you may find that someone has designed something similar or that would just undermine a patent that you made. You may be able to still get a patent through, but it's so thin and unprotectable and, and stuff. So, so I think from the outside, it's like, man, they should have patented this. But when you really dig in, uh, you may find that, oh, some XYZ guy so many years ago already did something that was close enough that it may, there may not be enough legs under something. And it's time and money too. And if, if everything's opportunity cost with resources and if, you rather put time and money into designing products and and kind of making sure everything aligns well. Then then that's that's that, as a consumer that's that's great too. Like for for consumers, I think uh, patents kind of probably are, are great for the brand. I I I appreciate patents and I support patents. But um, as some of these patents with different things run out, I'm gonna be excited to see where different brands different brands take things. With with I want to talk about prototypes now um, because we've we've chatted a lot about prototypes and um, you guys have mentioned that you have, are kind of always having a stable of prototypes that you're that you're testing and bringing into the field. Um, how many different iterations? Let's say with, with the CS40 as an example, probably um, on the more complicated side as far as products go. How many prototypes did you guys go through with with that with that pack? Probably. 10 maybe more um it's it's hard to remember the like exactly across all the things um but it's yeah i feel like um in the progression we kind of got to a point pretty quickly with just a few but then 
the it's the finite tweaks that um f- for us uh we have to make a finite tweak and then like take it backpacking which is time consuming um but yeah i mean with the cs40 specifically like we the pack had moved along pretty well and we're generally happy with it but we knew that there were some some refinements that we just wanted to be 100 percent sure we were comfortable with and uh you know certain areas of the pack that we just just kept making one like less you know we're talking a few millimeters of change you know in some measurement or a curve here and there and then and then take a backpacking and then um tweak it some more and repeat and we did that a few more times probably four or five more times just in this one area of the backpack that was that the frame that no it was the it was the shoulder straps it was the shoulder strap curvature um yeah we just wanted for everybody that used it to have no issues and and that was that's what it took you know and so yeah especially with shoulder straps too that's not that's not one where you're you can just say okay so this is the issue let's make this adjustment and run with it because you're not going to know that that's fixed unless you actually go do a real world backpacking trip you know day after day because that's where the issues were it was you know not just after a couple hour hike it was you know on day two or day three after multiple miles you know so is is it difficult to design for like even though you have the avatar avatar everyone's kind of different different shapes different body sizes like like taste has gigantic legs and kind of a medium-sized torso i have teeny tiny legs and a medium-sized torso brigham's kind of well proportioned has a human like how how do you kind of account for all those different different things? It's just a lot of luck. I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> not, a lot not, of... not you personally. <laughs> I wasn't good, refer- good genes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I wasn't referring to the the body comment. I was <laughs> no. It's uh with the product. It's um it's just prototyping and and uh, just getting a sense for. You know, if if you go through a number of prototypes how, and if you have, you know, a, a good variety of body types, use it in a lot of different trips. Because, um, like, trip conditions, they're, like, be re- it's really hard to be scientific with trip conditions because the terrain can even make a, back, a, a pack feel differently from one trip to another. And you could be thinking, well, you know, we didn't change anything on this pack. Why does it feel differently? Um but that's something to take into account. So yeah, multiple body types, multiple trips in varying different conditions and terrain. That's how, I think that's how we've been able to do it to the level that we're at now. Um, and we're always trying to improve things. We have, um, so, you know, some resources at our disposal that we've um, organized and, you know, in terms of like sizing and fit groups. Um, and so... We, we utilize them as, as, as best as we can. And, um, like we're never going to stop trying to improve how we're able to make any given product work for as many people as possible. Yeah. Maybe to add to that too, is, um, there could be compromises there too. Um, you know, as a business, you, you put yourself out there and you'll, you'll always get some complaints. Right. And, and so it's possible that, certain demographics, um, are harder for us to cover and certain demographics, um, take women, for example, like we would love to offer everything in women, but from a financial and business standpoint, that can be difficult. So typically we will release something in a men's size and hopefully it'll work okay for women, you know, but, but then if it's a, if it's a popular product and as we grow, we can justify releasing in a women's model where maybe the cut in the hips is different. And, and it just, um, so we, we, yeah, like like we definitely kind of design for our target demographic of of who who spends money with us really, and then and then from there we we try to expand that as much as we we possibly can. But um, yeah, it's it's a difficult thing to just have. And I think I think from a customer's perspective, sometimes like why can't you have this? Like I get on forums and there's 50 people that want this thing, and and it's like yeah, like 50 people isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things, and those 50 people aren't going to be 
totally brand loyal to one business. They just want, you know, sometimes they can want every brand to offer these. And, and we've done that. Like we've offered, um, some sizes and some huge ranges and we got like the first like five or 10 people to buy them that were like on our list. And then that inventory never moved again. And, and so that's, I mean, just from a financial standpoint, I think that it can be valuable to touch on that, but, um, yeah, I mean, we, we do the best we can to, to nail the fit for as many people as we can in, in our core focus. And then as, as possible, we roll out additional options for better fit. You know, maybe a women's backpacking harness would be something that, that would be great for us to be able to approach it at some point in the, in the future here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, like you said, it's, it's like outdoor vitals. You're not a huge, like multi hundred people company. Um, and yeah, I, I like the approach of, of do like covering as much as you can and then increasing as like sales happen and as, as people use the product and you get, get some of that information. I'm, I'm curious with, with prototyping, how do you decide that? Okay, we're done. We're done prototyping. Like, cause, cause I, I think of things that it's, it's very easy for me and my personality type to just always trying to like be tweaking that next little thing and squeeze the next little bit of improvement out of something. But there's, there's definitely a time where you just need to be like, okay, this is, it's, it's good enough for release right now. And we're, we'll improve it with V2, V3, V4. Um, but I imagine that's a difficult decision to make sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess maybe sometimes it is difficult. I mean, a lot of it, um, like kind of the first thing is to go back to, okay, did we accomplish the priorities that we set out at the beginning? I mean, that's like the easiest one. If, if, if something's still lacking there, then obviously I have still more work, more work to do. Um, and then it's also, you know, from those priorities that creates a, a bigger list of things. And so then we kind of look at, did we accomplish all of those things? Um, are we, are they all satisfactory? And, um, and then it's all, then we're, it, a lot of it is just, okay, how did it field test? How did it perform in the field? Um, and kind of how we gauge, you know, if something is, is ready is, you know, are we confident putting this in people's hands? Do we feel like we've done everything we can to make this what we intend it to be for them? Um, and then after all of our, our testing and field experience with the product, are there no complaints? Um, you know, no, no issues among anybody that's used it. Um, kind of those two general areas are, that's where we're, we're very happy and, and confident that it's ready to go. And once, once you have a product released and I think pretty much every, everyone's kind of like, is going to probably have a V2 or V3 of a product for the most part, unless they just completely discontinue it. Where, where is most of that, um, input coming from for the next versions? Is it, is it, can, are you guys continuing the design process or, cause I imagine you can't put the same amount of resources into like the, the next tweak or is it coming from, um, uh, that's, that's me putting words in your mouth. So feel free to correct me. <laughs> um, or is it c coming from kind of user feedback? Um, how, how are you getting to that, to the next stage iteration? Um, we definitely pay attention to reviews and f user feedback. Um, that's, that's a very strong influence on, you know, we're like, I just constantly make notes of all these things. Um, and, uh, even things that are good, like things that are good, those are things to expound upon and, and to hold on to. But yeah, um, anything that's more feedback for improvement. Yeah. Definitely just kind of recording that and, uh, letting that drive, you know, what we would be updating, uh, in the future. And then, um, you know, to be honest, I like all the ideas can't possibly ever come at, on one given date. And that's, that's the reality is that b because we just keep going backpacking and getting, getting out there, like we do come up with new ideas, um, that we just never had come up with before up until that point. So you know, that does, that does come into it as well. Like, Hey, this, um, this would be a, maybe a really good idea to put onto, you know, this next generation of product. Yeah. That's a good point with creativity. You never know when it's going to hit you and it could hit you for a specific part of a product at, at any point. And then that, that comes into the next, next iteration. Um, 
with with prototyping and everything um how often does a product not make it into production like do you do you guys start design start the design process and then and they just aren't and kind of realize okay we can't really release this and what yeah we'll start with that I'd say a lot of that um i don't know let's say you start with 10 products there's going to be like five that go smoothly there might be two that and Brigham you you do you give your numbers later because this is just totally <laughs> like arbitrary I probably so, don't have a number yeah so I'll say like two get like pivoted pretty hard maybe at some point uh one or two are gonna like just get put on the back burner for a while like you realize this isn't really a priority for us or maybe it's a, a partner issue or maybe it's a technological issue and so you kind of like put a pin in those ones and then there's the the one or two at the end that just never make it, right? Um, I would say we get better and better at, like, over time, like, having less of those. But that's that's not a good thing necessarily or a bad thing, right? Like, it might mean that we're a little bit better at, like, flushing out the ideas to begin with um, just with more time. But um, I think we should always be having things that don't make it to market because it just means we're testing as much as we can. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and it you know, an idea on one date, it, it, you know, you can think of it as a seed really is like, you know, maybe that seed did not take root because there was something flawed in that little seed, but you're still going to remember it three years later, you know, and, you know, have another thought that's related to the original idea that actually is, could make it much better or more practical or, or more feasible. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I think it is, like Tayson said, I think it's good to have some of those products because there's still seeds that are planted. You know, we have some, like, we have products that, man, we they never saw the light of day, but we still have prototypes of them. And uh, those are things that could potentially become a great product that, that the customer gets. I'm probably going to start thinking of you as the gear gardener, just planting little gear seeds and then growing these products and then harvesting them and putting them out into the world and <laughs> it's uh yeah it's I, I like the analogy though it's it's true it's sometimes you're gonna plant a seed and it's and it's not gonna not gonna take root how how often especially maybe for some of the products that might have a longer development time do you get to the point where you're like like it's, it's looking great and then all of a sudden a competitor or something releases almost like the identical product or a product that um might impact that like how you design it or or anything like that because I, 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 I was I'm thinking of when I was talking with Rab and they're like real, they're really excited about making a fully recycled um, a, a, a pad made of fully recycled materials and then the year, they spent like five years developing it the year they release it every, everyone has a pad made with recycled materials <laughs> and it didn't impact like the, the release but it was kind of like I guess we got to change our, our marketing copy now <laughs> well Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, um, how much, so to recap, how much does what other people release impact what might change in our process? Um, I would say I haven't noticed that it's changed a lot of our process, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, number one, that what's interesting about the RAB, the RAB comment is um, when you get into the production of, of some of these materials, and you have a long exposed history in the in the industry, you pretty much know like so many of the fabric producers, so many of the insulation producers, so many of, of the pad producers, you know what I mean? And, and so then they may have come and pitched this recycled concept to 10 companies. And, and then they come and they all think that they're kind of on their own trajectories and they might be building a similar product with the same technology from one particular supplier. Um, I would say, thankfully for us, because we're direct to consumer, because we're small and we're just able to act quick on our feet, like like if you're in retail, you might be, de be designing two years out. Whereas if we get a product ready to go, like we're designing a year out or something, right? So because of that, I think it's, it's less of a factor for us than maybe other companies. Um, but I can see at times where that's happened. And you can see times like from an insider standpoint, um, 
there's a material out there that came to market for a massive company and you know it was like all of this marketing around how they developed it and how they you know like spent years on you know all this kind of stuff and then and then you meet the supplier and you're like oh yeah we licensed it to him for two years and then the next year it comes out and all these other pieces you know what i mean and 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 that's just the behind the scenes stuff that that happens but i would say thankfully for us um we haven't had to deal with that much. And I think that's partially starting with a clean slate and partially starting uh, being in the position we are with how quick we can develop and, and release things compared to bigger, slower brands. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I think it, it's, it's interesting getting the behind the scenes and, and kind of that, that insider's perspective on, on all this whole process. And um, that's, that's been a really cool part about having this podcast and having different people on um, to, to talk about gear and, and everything. And, it was, it was awesome going on the trip with you guys, getting to know you guys, chat about the gear, um, talk about the design process today. Cause we, we, we didn't, we talked about design a little bit on the trip, but I think we, we dove a little, a little bit deeper, um, in the podcast today. I just really, really appreciate spending time with you guys and, and having you on the podcast. Yeah. Um, it was great hanging out with you and I, I enjoy talking about this stuff and, uh, you know, I can, I can go on and on as you found out earlier yesterday. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, it was, it was our privilege to, to be able to come backpacking with you. Um, you know, I'd second that Justin is a good backpacker. I mean, we drug him through some some kind of interesting hard miles, and and uh, he crushed it. And um, but no, I, I mean, I I just appreciate like what you do with the podcast and how you dig into these details. Um, it's clear from from being on trail with you and the number of questions you ask the how much you pay attention and how how much you dig deeper than the superficial level on things and um i think that equates to just all around better information for people out there and better knowledge right and knowledge really is power knowledge is you know i i I, you know kind of say this kind of stuff a lot but i mean we could put we could put you in the cheapest gear we could find and you could have a way better experience than someone with um you know the most expensive uh uh, backpacking equipment they, that you could even find. And, and you may have a better experience just from that knowledge perspective, but the farther down this you get, the more understanding the product matters and, and you dig in and just do a phenomenal job. So it's our privilege to have you out here and to be on the podcast as well. Appreciate that. Yeah. Look, looking forward to the next, next trip and we'll definitely have to do another episode down the road.